There's booklets. If you want a booklet still. So uh, we're going to go now. So we're going to go to part two. Oh, no, part three. We're going to go to part three. I made these booklets. I updated all my PowerPoints, so these should be all new PowerPoints. We're going to start with the heart. We're going to do the cardiovascular system. We're going to do heart today. Then for next visit, I want you to, for Monday, I would like you to go through blood. And I'd like you to go through vessels. And then we'll go through uh, immune system. Then we go to the uh, endocrine system and the integumentary system. And then I pray to the Lord. I have my next book with ready. Otherwise, we'll see what we'll do. But, so when we look at the heart today, I'm going to be familiar with a few things. Where is the heart located? How is it inside looking? What attached to the heart? The heart's actually two pumps in one. So we want to talk about that. And then we have, we have to figure out how the blood pumps the heart through the heart in one direction. So we'll talk about a little bit of that. And then we'll get more into the physiology where we look at the, the conduction, the electrocardiogram, which is the, the pumping, the electricity. Uh, and we talk about the pumping versus the non-pumping. So that will guide us later on into the blood pressure where we talk about that on Wednesday. Uh, and then we need to have a formula how to measure how much blood goes through the system at one point in time. So if you look at this heart, look at it. This is a bit big, so it's not. So it's right there in the chest. Should be about fist size. So it's right there. It's pointing down, so it has a, a bottom going down. That will be called the apex. Down here it says apex. When we look in the back, posteriorly we have the spinal, well that's actually the trachea, but we have the spinal column in the back, so the vertebral stuff is in the back. And in the front, you have the sternum that covers it in the front, so that's kind of nice. And then on the side, you got the lungs, that's very nice to outline, I mean to, to protect the heart. And, and the inferior border, which is sort of in some ways an important one, the diaphragm, because it separates the chest from the abdomen. The chest is more uh, airy and the abdomen is more watery type. That's why when we talked about core strength, we want to compress down here to have this strong. We don't want to compress up here. That's just air. We'll compress down here to core. The, as I said before, it tips down, for, uh, it goes inferior like that a little bit. It has a tip to it and the tip is down here. And that's inferior. But superior, we call what's there, it's the base, the superior. So that's the basic outline. When we, this one is, is always a little difficult to, to explain. I'm, I'm hoping, I'm, I'm trying to get better at it. So when we look at, at, at the heart, as well as the lungs and the abdomen, they need to be protected by, uh, well for once, the heart, for example, pumps all the time. So how is that gonna be in there pumping and then everything else, it frictions against it. So that's kind of a problem, so we don't, want that because that will wear out real fast or if anybody ever had a condition called pleurisy which is a lung condition when when there's friction between the lung and the chest wall it hurts like crazy yeah it's not i think oh, i never had it i don't want it so what the body does is very smart the body has the way of protecting the heart the lungs as well as the gut the abdominal viscera with a system called the serous membranes, serous membranes right here. What it is, the serous membrane, is, it's, an, it's, a, it's a membrane that's attached, that starts up, it doesn't start up here, but here's a, an important point up here. It, it goes on, right on the heart, and then it goes around the heart, and over here, it goes and, and, and continuously then goes around the wall of the heart, outside. So we have a, a membrane that is attached at the end of the day, that is attached on the heart itself and on the chest wall, and it is continuous, it is not broken. So what we get at the end, we get a little film of space inside here. And that film we can fill with fluid. And that fluid has a name, of course, but it doesn't matter what the name is, but that fluid then gives us this ability to have no friction. So now the heart can pump, and the inside pumps against it, but then it doesn't 
They might touch the outside layer, but it doesn't matter. There's fluid in between. It dissipates all the forces. And so that's really cool. So we have that organ suspended within that serous membrane as if, like, the idea that I like a lot is you, you visualize a balloon, and you push your fist into the balloon, and you have a little bit of balloon that's attaching to the fist, and you have the balloon outside. That's that thing. It's not two membranes, it's one membrane. Except if you cut it, you might think it's two. And that's how they came up with that. So uh, it's creating that way an enclosed space. So that space in here is enclosed. And in there, we're gonna, uh, 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 redo, we're gonna secrete, uh, where is that called? We're gonna secrete that serous fluid. That's that watery fluid that's inside of there. And then that helps reduce friction when we move, when the heart moves, for example. But also, in the lungs, it's really cool, because when you breathe, you actually have the chest wall expand. You don't have the lungs themselves breathe. So the chest wall expands, and the lungs have to be attached to the chest wall, and then they inflate that way, they get bigger in space. And then the air flows into the mouth, through. That's in inhalation. So it, it's done by muscle, but the muscle, mostly the diaphragm goes down and it increases that cavity up here, but the lungs get pulled because the part of the membrane that's attached to the chest wall or the diaphragm pulls the lungs with them and expands it. And so there is another reason why we have that system in there. In this situation, the problem is if something happens and you get a, a rib break or somebody's a jerk and stab you, you get air in between this, the lung will collapse. It cannot be suctioned against the chest wall. It's called an adelectasis. I know, just go to the ER, it'll show up at some point. Um, so that's a really, really cool system. It's a little complicated to understand, uh, but just visualize that fist thing. That will get you there. Uh, one more thing I need to talk here. The, the part of the membrane that's attached to the organ, or the heart here, or the lung here, is known as the visceral layer of that serous membrane. And in the heart, that serous membrane is called, actually, is called the pericardium. I got to get to that too. So the system, the serous membranes, is it's, it's similar in the lungs, in the heart particularly, and then the abdominal cavity is a little bit different, but it's very similar still. But depending on where it is, it has a different name. So in the heart, it's known as the pericardium. If you look at the word cardium, anything that has cardium in it, you know is heart. That's just a given. And peri, when you see the word peri, it means around. Around something. A peri means around something. So a pericardium is a membrane around the heart. Heart, heart. Cardium is always heart. So we have now a, a one that's a, a visceral pericardium that's right on a heart muscle. And then we have the parietal pericardium, parietal layer or pericardium, and that's on the chest wall, on the wall, on the outside. Parietal means outside. Visceral always. Visceral, you think organ. When you think visceral, you think organ. When you get to the to the heart lung, we're gonna call it the pleura. We'll get to that when we do that then. And we get to the gut, we're gonna call it the peritoneum. We're gonna get to that too when we get there. Um, does that make a little bit of sense? Uh-huh. Good, good, good. So just keep the story at that level. And I think. It took me a few times around this one to understand, although you know I started as a foreigner, so I didn't speak any English at first. So that was its own thing. So then from there we want to go and talk about that a little more in the heart. So the whole thing where the heart sits in is known as the pericardial sac. And the serous membranes is part of that. So the pericardial sac is just the bag that the heart sits in. We have the most, we're going to go from the outer layer to the inner layer. So the most outer layer is a, a fibrous layer. And then on the inside of that, here's the fiber, the fibrous layer. On the inside of that, we have the parietal layer of the pericardium. So that's the stuff on the chest wall. 
And, and it makes sense that outside layer of anything that attaches anything inside the body is gonna be fibers. You wanna have a lot of fibers anchoring that stuff to the body. And here you see the, all the fibers right here anchoring this stuff. That's, that's always the case. If you're looking at a gut tube, you've got multiple layers and the outside layer is gonna be a lot of fibers anchoring things together, holding it together. And the more inside layer is the stuff where the function happens. Uh, like in a heart, it's going to be the pumping of the heart. And then when we go deeper, we're going to see here, here you see that membrane, how it's connected. Because this here then is the epicardium and that's the visceral pericardium. So the nice deer anatomy people had too much wine and then they made two names. So we have to learn to it. So the epicardium is the same as the visceral pericardium. Says your visceral layer. And when you look again at the name, you, it's not that difficult. The cardium means heart. Peri meant the round. Now, epi means on top. It's another word. Epi means on top. We, we use those, so they use them sometimes one, sometimes the other. It's just the prefixes. And if you learn some of them, you know, we're starting to get. So, so the prefix peri means around. An epi means on top or upon the top. Often used similarly. Don't get too hung up on it. And then after that, the real deal happens because now we're going to get into the muscle of the heart, and that is known as the myocardium. And the word myo, remember, myo, muscle. So myocardium, the muscle. And then deeper, deeper still, right in the inside of the heart, because actually, you know, when you open a heart up, it's got chambers inside. It's hollow on the inside. And you know that? You probably knew that, right? It's got these chambers. We're going to get to these chambers in a minute. And, and, and the inside of those chambers has a lining on it, too. And that lining is continuous with the inside of the blood vessel lining. I'm not sure you get that much if you keep talking. And that's on video. Hey. So that's the endocardium. Endo, when we look at the word endo, oh, endo, always means it means on the inside. Or it can mean self-made, like endogenous morphine or the endorphins. The endorphins is the word end orphans from end um, endogenous and morphine. So when you go running, you really make your own morphine. Yeah, I mean, well, you, 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 all the old things, just go running, right? Mm -hmm. well, duh. And we would have known that. And then on the inside below that, we get into the heart chambers. Um, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. So endocardium. Yeah, anything cardio means heart. Um, and if if this muscle needs a lot of oxygen, and we know that if it doesn't have enough oxygen, uh, it gets starved, it, it gets damaged, that's a heart attack. Or also known as a myocardial infarction. The myocardium has an infarct, it has no oxygen. And I already said that the endocardium, the inside layer, is continuous with the inside layer of a blood vessel. So in there, I, I wrote it down in, in the blood vessel, when you get to that, they call that an endothelium yeah. instead of an endocardium. It's the same thing though, it's the inside layer. Thelium, what does thelium mean? Well, it comes from epithelium, because it's the tissue type is epithelium. Oh, okay. It, and usually, you know, the inside of the tube, the lowest, the ins most inside layer is, is always epithelium. That's just, you know, it, that's one of the good, when you look at the tissues, you kind of want to group the stuff. You know, you don't just want to learn this tissue is there, this tissue is there. You want to understand it. So there we go. So now from there, we got to go a little deeper, and we're going to get to the blood vessels. So we all probably heard of arteries and veins, but we all sort of mostly think the arteries are red and the veins are blue. Right? No? Well, I did. I guess I just learned it a long time ago. But it's not true, so don't even learn it. 
Most of the time it is. But the definition of an artery is a vessel that carries blood away, away from the heart. So every vessel that goes, that, that, that goes right where blood comes out, so it's back in here and back in here, those vessels are all arteries. The vessels that bring the blood to the heart are known as veins. So they guide the blood from the body back to the heart. Most of the times, they're blue. They're the ones that bring the blood right into these chambers. When you look at the inside of the heart, you have like four chambers. You have two, one here, and you have one here, and then you got two below on the bottom. Yeah, you got two. You got two chambers. Yeah, you can actually get hearts over there if you want to follow the class with it. Sorry, I didn't bring them out. We got two chambers on top. Yeah, there's a bunch of hearts. We got two chambers on top, and that's where blood comes in. And where blood comes into the heart, that's those are then the veins. Those vessels that bring the blood into the heart are the veins. And then we got two chambers on the bottom, and from there the blood leaves the heart. And those are arteries. And the reason being is, it's okay, just pick it up. Hold, hold it tight. The, the reason being is, when the blood leaves the heart, the heart's a pump. It pumps really strong. And that pressure, there's a hydrostatic pressure that the blood has as it shoots out of the heart. That requires a very, very different vessel that it shoots the blood into than a vessel that just guides the blood back to the heart and has to dump it into the heart. So the difference there is the pressure. So arteries are high pressure vessels. They're thick walls to withstand a hydrostatic pressure. And veins are thin walled vessels they don't need to withstand that pressure. Once the blood is gone into the tissues, it's not gonna have any power anymore from pushing. That pushing comes from the heart. Your blood pressure that they measure comes from the heart pumping, not from the heart blood going back to the heart. And so those vessels, those veins are very different. They're very thin walled. Well, they're different in that they're very thin walled compared to the other ones. They still have the same layers, and we'll talk about those on Monday. And so arteries are here. Veins are here. Blood comes from the heart in the arteries. Blood goes to the heart in the veins. In between, the blood has to be diffu diffused to the tissues. That way we give the tissue the oxygen and the nutrients and we'll pick up some crap. Because when you think about the cardiovascular system, its job is really, it's like a freeway system that carries things around in the body. It's not the nerves, it's electricity that just is cables. It can carry nutrients, it can carry waste, it can carry anything that we can put in liquid. It can carry. The most thing for us that it carries is oxygen and nutrients and then the waste products goes back out. But it also has hormones and all that other stuff in it. And we'll talk about that in a, a Monday. But where we have the diffusion of all those things in and out of the tissues from the blood to the tissues, that's what we call the capillaries. So the capillaries are between the arteries at the vein, and they are leaky so that the blood seeps into the tissue to exchange the substances. And those are oxygen, nutrients, and the other things like we just mentioned. So those are the capillaries. So when we look at the vessels, we'll talk about, we don't talk about the capillaries too much, but we'll mention which vessel is called what a little bit in terms of blood vessels. But now let's go back to the heart because to those chambers, the inside of the heart. So we have here a, this is a nice heart. It's big words, I like that, we can read them. So the blood, that blood comes into the two top chambers, and the top chambers, the entrance chambers where the blood dumps in like this, from above and below actually here, and then here, it comes from behind. See, these are veins. Even they are looking red. That's why you can't say red is arteries and blue is veins. The only place, and we have to be careful, we do that in lab so we don't confuse it. 
This is the only place we have to worry about. So over there, is that a vein as well? That's the right, where you have the, the right atrium? Where you have the line? No, it's behind. There's the okay. two are behind. You can't see the other two coming in because that is as it splits. Okay. There. Yes, Michelle. The chain? Are we talking chambers? Yeah. No, the chambers are here. You open the flap. Okay. And then the other chamber is up here. No, that's a vessel. That's not a chamber. That thing is a vessel. That's going to be a vein because it brings blood into the first chamber, into the atrium. So the blood comes back to the heart from the veins into the atrium. We have one on the right. And we have one on the left. Oh. And the reason for that is the heart is actually two hearts. If you think about it, look at this picture. If you think about it, the block carries your oxygen to the tissues. Mm -hmm. And the block gets the oxygen from the lungs. Or to the body and gets it from the lungs. So we have to have a part of where the block travels by the lungs and picks up the oxygen. Right? And so that's this part, the heart block. Oh crap, what's this? Oh, there we go, good. The, 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 the blood comes in on the right, to the right atrium from the body, uh -huh. and then it goes down, and let's go to the next chamber, because the next chamber is known as a ventricle. So that's the bottom chamber. We're on the heart here. It's this one on the right that I'm looking at right now, right down here. Okay. And then from there, the heart pumps, and the blood gets shooted out into these vessels right here. Right now, we don't do these vessels. Right now, we're only doing the chambers. We'll do the vessels in a minute. And so, in here, this is right here. The blood comes in on the right side, from the atria to the ventricle, and then it goes right up here, and then it goes to the lungs. And then from the lungs, it picks up the oxygen from the lungs, and from the lungs, it then comes back down to the heart and enters into the, right, the left atrium, right over here. It's a little hidden, but it's the top one. The top, yeah, there you go, the top one. This one. No, the top, no, the, you had it, you had it. Look at mine. Yeah, right there. So that's the left atrium. And then from the left atrium, the blood sort of drops into the left ventricle. And when the ventricle, when the heart contracts, it shoots the blood up into these vessels. And from there, that means it then goes to the whole body and feeds the body with oxygen and nutrients. So we have two circuits. We have a heart, it's two pumps. We, if we have one pump, we just take half of this. That would be one pump. But it's two pumps. And it blocks, pumps blood into a pulmonary circuit. Anything that's known as lung is pulmonary. What's a pathology? You get you know, pulmonary is lung. And the bottom one would be called the systemic circuit. So pulmonary circuit is the lung pick up oxygen. Systemic circuit is the blood goes through the whole body. The whole system. The whole system. So, I know, I know. So, each of the two circuits both have a receiving chamber, which is the atrium or the atria, and an ejection chamber, which is the ventricle or the ventricles. As it's two of them. The right, the, le the right side is pulmonary, and the left side, the right side goes to the lungs, and the left side goes to the system. each side has its own Right, and each side has to have a place. Because the reason is this. If you, if you think the, mouth, the heart is a muscle, it's a thick muscle that contracts all the time, strong. 
It, it just doesn't, it's not work. It wouldn't be working if the blood would go straight to the ventricles and then it shoots it back out. How do you prevent the blood from going back up to the chambers, to the channels? And we'll get to that how we do it, but we couldn't, I don't think the heart could be built by having these valves over here, where the, they would be, the doors would be closed. I think there is too much force going on that we need uh, uh, these, these two chambers on each side of the heart. Pulmonary, pulmonary is right, and systemic is left. And somewhere I have to put this one, at the right and the left atria are divided by a wall. When you see the word septum, you think thinking kind of wall or something that shunts something up from the other side or something like that. So that will know, be known in the, up here as the interatrial septum. Yeah, be careful actually. This one, this doesn't show the interatrial septum even though it appears it is. What this shows, and I, I like this picture a lot because it shows that next one, the one between the ventricles, really nice, and that's known as the interventricular septum. So if you look at your model, there is a membrane between the two top chambers, which you just have to sort of feel. And that membrane is the interatrial septum between the atria, inter means in between. And then down in here, that thick muscle here, that's the interventricular septum. So that's important. The reason, one reason why that's important is because we have blood vessels here, and we also have nerves that go down into it. Yes, Michelle? No, no, you say. Interventricular septum. The, the, the importance about the interatrial septum is you can see here inside there's a little indentation in the heart. Number, I think it's number 55 or something. And that's a hole, a fossa ovale, and in, a, in, a, in an embryo that hole is open. It's a foramen ovale. Foramen means hole, right? Ovale means round. Um, and as we get born within the 24 hour period, it closes up. Because we, we first don't need, we don't need that pulmonary circuit when we're in the womb. That's the placenta stuff. We just need the systemic circuit. And so as soon as we're born, we're needing to shift from mommy giving us oxygen to the world giving us oxygen. And it's that, the breath. And by that moment, that closes up. It's within 24 hours, it closes up. But sometimes they're not closed up and they call something that's not closed. They call that a patent. Patent. That means open. So patent for amen of all, or maybe it's called fossa of all. If patent fossa of all, once it's closed, they call it a fossa and not a for amen. But if it's patent, that's a pathology. That's an insufficient heart. So there is a little bit of a leaking going on, and some of the blood goes from one side to the other. So it, it, the oxygen gets a little diluted that way. Anyway, that's about all I know about. So now, when we look back to the inside of the heart, we have to make sure that we do not have backflow when the muscle of the heart contracts. So if we just have everything is open, everything can move around in its place, and we contract, some of the blood will go where we want it to go. Some of the blood will go back. <laughs> cannot have that, that's not sufficient. So what we do is we have valves. We have two sets of valves that guard those chambers. They prevent blood backflow. Um, we have, well all four valves, they, all four valves lay in, in, in a plane that's sort of around, around the top of the heart between the ventricle and the atrium. And they're made of, of, of some, they're on a cardiac skeleton. So this cardium, this heart, when you take a heart out of a body, it's red, but you can strip all the muscle out of it. You see the same heart, it's white. That's a fascia. Fascia is everywhere. It's just the red overpowers the white. And, and, and the fascia around where those layers of those valves are is a thicker, stronger fascia. So you gotta understand if you look at let me see if I have a picture. Yeah, see, I got a good picture here, I think. 
Right in here, that's where they are. If you think of the heart muscle, that's like a complicated thing that has a lot of things that it needs to hold on to. It doesn't have muscle, it can pull them. So the skeleton, the fascia, that's been called the cardiac skeleton in this situation, is very, very important. And so the valves all lay in there because there is more strength in there. And so it's basically flaps of, of, of endocardium, the inside of that heart muscle, the heart layer, that epithelium that makes cusps or flaps. When you see here, see here these flaps that go down, they guard, they can be closed or they can be open. So when we look at the valves that guard the ventricle to the atrial, that's those valves. They call those the tricuspid, oh no, they call those the atrial, sorry, ventricular valves, because they go between the atrium and the ventricle. So that's pretty logical. Those are these white ones here. You can see the white ones. Because the way that they're made is they have these flaps, these flaps coming down as in the cardium, and then you've got, you've, got, you've got the flaps attached to strings called corda tendine right here, and then on the bottom you have a muscle where it attaches it. You can not really see it this in here that well, but it's, it's there. It's called a papillary muscle. And as the heart is relaxed, it's hanging down a little. When the muscle is relaxed, it's kind of longer and not as puffy. In the same in here, right? The body, you can see that. And, and when the heart muscle is relaxed, it hangs down a little more. And as it contracts, it shrinks up a little. And, and those strings go up a little, like sails on, strings on a sailboat that you hold tension on. And as the heart contracts, they close up that gap between the ventricle and the atria because they move upward and they close. So that's it's fantastic. And uh, we have two of those. We have one on the right side, and we have one on the left side. And when you look at the names, they all are called atrioventricular valves but the one on the right has three little flaps, so they call that a tricuspid, tri means three, and the other one on the left has only two flaps, which, yeah, it's hard to make that out, but you'll make it out, or you just remember that. Uh, the that's called the bicuspid valve, or they also call that the mitral valve, because of the bishop's mitral looks like that, it's two flaps. I know, you, then you know it's from Italy, this whole thing, or something. Old Europe. So those are pretty neat, and I really uh, uh, think that's, well, I think the heart's pretty genius, actually. Uh, and then we, we have the other two valves, and the other two valves, they have to make, they have to guard the exit of the ventricles. You see this one really well here. The other one is deep on the inside behind the other flap. So these, so the one you see right here. So those are both guarding the exit of the ventricle. So when you locate them, you know that's where the exit is for the ventricle. So the one on the left is deep. The one on the right, we can see quite well going in this big vessel up here. We call those semi-lunar valves because they um, are made of three upward looking endothelial uh, folds, endothelial folds. And, and they look like, they, they think they look like a half moon. It's half lunar, I know. Semi means half, lunar means moon. So, I know, again, maybe too much wine, I'm not sure. Oh wait, it's here, sorry, <laughs> that's the tricuspid down here. So that's what they sort of said, saw it look like a moon. Um, we have, The one on the right side is known as the pulmonary valve, the pulmonary semilunar valve, but we can just call it pulmonary valve because it guards the entrance into the pulmonary circuit. And then this great vessel coming up over here is going to be called the pulmonary trunk. We'll get to that in a minute. The other one that guards on the left side for uh, uh, the blood that goes then into the systemic circuit is known as the aortic valve or the aortic semilunar valve because the big vessel that comes up here, this round thing, is the aorta. And you, have you heard of the aorta before? 
No. That's this round thing. So pulmonary and semi and aortic. That's pretty good stuff. Oh look, good. We did a lot. We did a lot of that already. The right side, so the, the, now we go to the sides of the heart again in more detail. The right side of the heart concerns itself with pumping blood to the lungs where oxygen is picked up and gas, gaseous waste is disposed. The big one we talk about is CO2 on that phone. The oxygenated blood from the body tissue. So the body uses the oxygen up because we want to move muscle. That's what uses oxygen, making energy, making ATP. So that deoxygenated, D means away, that D means away, so there's no oxygen in that blood. From the body goes into the right atrium via, via the superior and inferior vena cava. The superior and inferior vena cava. So those big vessels on here that bring blood from above, this is down here, from below and above are the vena cava, vena cava, vena cava. From there then, the tricuspid valve opens and blood goes into the right ventricle. So we have blood coming in here, vena cava, they just show one, they don't show the superior and inferior, they just show the superior. But the blood goes into the atrium and from there it travels into the ventricle and then from there when the ventricle contracts, or when the heart contracts, both ventricles contract at the same time. The whole heart contracts pretty much at the same time. And when that happens, the, this is the, the uh, pulmonary semilunar valves open, and what's interesting, those valves are closed when the heart is at rest. The other valves are open when the heart is at rest. When the heart contracts, the pulmonary and aortic valves are pushed open by the force of the contraction, by the, like the water is opening the gate. The blood flow is so strong, it's pushing them open. And what's cool about that is, um, while it sets, it makes the heart force stronger at the moment of ejection, and then the blood, when the heart contracts again, the valves close and the blood that's left in here somewhere does not fall back into the ventricle. So it creates that efficiency then or um, lack of thereof if there wouldn't be a, a place. And then, um, so we have those semilunar valves that open and from there the, lung, uh, the blood is then pumped into the lungs via the, the pulmonary arteries, although we need to say here uh, trunk slash arteries, so write that in there, trunk slash arteries. We'll get to that when we do the list, so you know, it's just about the confusion, that's all. And once the lungs pick up that gas, so I mean, once the oxygen goes into the, into the blood, that blood will have to be returned back to the heart. And the way that blood comes back to the heart is through the pulmonary veins. So in this schematic, you see You see the pulmonary arteries, so how the blood comes up here and goes into here. I know it's not the best picture, but the labels are good. And then as the blood is oxygenated in the lungs, it comes back via the pulmonary veins. Now this is the place where the veins are red. And that's, that's then these here. And Actually, Danielle, they are these back here. They are back here. So they bring them in from two sides into the left um, left atrium now. The left side of the heart, and then uh, from there, from the left side of the heart. So we go into we go into the left atrium from there, and then into the left ventricle from there, through now the bicuspid valve, again a valve, always between the two chambers there's a valve. And when that part of the heart contracts, the blood will be pumped through D, 
the semilunar valve, that's the aortic semilunar valve, into the aortic or into the aorta, the aortic trunk, it's called. So that's this big thing, is known the aortic trunk, the aortic arch. Um, the first portion, then when a vessel just comes, like like this vessel is very interesting to see. This known, this is known as the pulmonary trunk. Right as it comes out of the right ventricle. But right there, you see it splits very fast. And from that point on, when it splits, they're going to call it a pulmonary artery. So if you have a vessel, a blood vessel that's short and then it splits right away, the short portion is known as the trunk. And then otherwise, you've got to call it artery or vein. But that's why they use that word trunk. And so you've got a few of those places here. And so as the aortic the blood that's oxygenated comes out through the aortic arch it has three stumps that come off of it the first stump is known as the brachiocephalic ha that's where they made a mistake this would be called trunk Instead of artery. yep brachiocephalic trunk because again right there it's this long and it goes into it goes into a, 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 an artery and another artery. It splits right away. So that's the first stump. And so this blood up here on that first stump comes up like that and then it goes to the head and some of it goes to the arm. On the right side, right here. The right side. Yeah, you got it. Mm -hmm. And then we go to the next one. That's blood that goes straight to the head. And so they call that the common carotid artery. Is it too small on that one? Can you read it? Yeah. So that's the carotid. When you see carotid, you think head. Carotid, you think head. And then the last stump that comes off goes to the left arm. And here's the clavicle. And the artery goes right underneath the clavicle. So they call that the subclavian artery. Salt means like, you know, salt marine, <laughs> below. So the subclavian artery. So we gotta learn these three things in lab. So, so we got the brachiocephalic trunk. It's on the, on the lab list, I'll give it to you. Mm -hmm. It's the left common carotid, and it's the left subclavian. Okay. But what I like about this picture, Michelle, is the fact that the trunk splits right here, very fast under. And there it goes right into an outer carotid on the right side and a right subclavian. This is not on the test, but I want you to understand the concept of trunk and order. Because I think that's helpful. Well, All right, that's question. Yep. Um, so is that why they call the heart um, uh, the what is it, the left side uh, uh, aortic trunk? Is that why in fact? Mm, oh, uh, uh, my my um, um, cardiac enlargement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they talk yeah, that's what it, so. Look at this picture. That that's a good point. So when you look at the two circuits, the right side of the part pumps the blood to the lungs. That's right here. That's right. It goes right next to each other. But the so that 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 heart does not need to be so forceful. But the left side of the heart needs to pump that blood to the whole body. So when you look at the walls, and I don't know if they did it here, a little bit, the, the, right, the left side is very thick. The right side is much thin, thinner. That's why I put this here. This here is the left ventricle. This is the right ventricle. And this here is the interventricular septum. Because it has to be the same size as the wall on the left side, otherwise it's going to push the wall over there, or it's going to, you know, get pushed, get um, bent over there, or, or uh, stretched over there. So that's why I put this picture up because I think it's a nice in, in show, showing the difference, and that's why the fog stuff is more on the right, the left side. It's on the left. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, what you also have on this uh, on this picture here that I like is is mostly for the booklet. You have all the labels. And you have and you have all the arrows, so you. I think this picture is probably as good as you need to get on a heart for us, and for bio too, probably. Yeah, right there. 
see you have the arrows, you see the blood coming. Let me do it again, right? You see the blood coming into the vena cava from below below above. We go into the vent, the atria. We go through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. You go through then the semilunar valve on the aortic side, no, on the pulmonary side, to the lungs, pulmonary trunk pulmonary trunk and then pulmonary arteries. You get everything labeled there. And then from the lungs, we bring the blood back through the pulmonary veins when it's oxygenated, going into the left atrium through the bicuspid valve into the left ventricle out in the back here. You can just make it out right here, the valve, where it pushes it out into the aortic arch. And from there it goes to the whole body. And I put those main ones here somewhere. Yeah, see, I sort of show how this goes to the lungs, but then everything else goes goes to the goes from the left side. Only the lungs get fed from the right side. Well, I'm not sure if that picture is accurate for that, but that's what I try to show. And now the heart is a muscle, so it pumps blood, but that it also needs its own blood. And it cannot just take blood from in here and say, oh, let me seep it in. No, that's, that wouldn't work. It's like it does not feed, the blood in here does not feed the heart muscle. The heart muscle has to be fed by vessels on the outside. So there's two vessels that come out. You can see one right here, which comes out right here on the auric arch. So there's two vessels come out, one in the front, one in the back. And those are the coronary vessels, the coronary artery, you have the right coronary artery and then the left coronary artery, you can't really see it comes from behind inside of here. So the left coronary artery comes up right behind the semilunar valve. The right RCA, the right coronary artery feeds the right ventricle and the majority of the heart's posterior, so the back side. And the left coronary artery, the LCA, feeds the front of the heart and you can see here, it comes forward here, oops, and one split goes down in the middle, that's the interventricular artery, like the uh, anterior interventricular artery, or branch, and then the part that goes around the heart is like a crown, a corona, or a circumflex, the corona is the heart itself, but they call that the circumflex artery, it goes around. And those are, the, those are the ones I want you to know. The RCA and then the LCA, the interventricular and the, and the uh, circumflex. And it might be on the list also when the, the venous return. So in, in the organs, you will, ch you will use the red for artery and the blue for vein because in there it's always true like that, except for the lungs. So the only confusion with that is for the pulmonary circuit in reality. But you will have red that's the oxygen feeding vessels, and then blue, that's the draining vessels. And they pretty much have the same names for most part, so that's why I don't make you do the, ve the veins at all. But there's one vessel, one vein, that is back here where the blood that comes back pools together before it dumps it into the right atrium. And that part is called the coronary sinus. And I want you to know the word sinus because we're thinking of sinus, sinus type sinus in the skull. But a sinus just means a space. And so where there is a space where blood sort of accumulates and then it bumps it into something else. That's also called a sinus. And one of the most famous ones is the coronary sinus in the heart. So that way you also know that part. Okay. Yeah, I like that um, coronary vessel. That's a pretty good picture too. And then from there we go into the conduction. We talk about the heart and how it pumps. So if you have a muscle, you need to have a stimulation of a nerve to have a muscle be able to contract. And so uh, the heart also is stimulated by nerves. But as you have noticed, the heart's kind of cool because it pumps pretty consistently about 70 so times per minute. And it just does that. So it actually has this independent source of nerve impulse. So the heart's not nerve impulse from the brain like the muscles in the arm and all the other ones. It actually has its own 
brain a little bit that um, feeds it with an impulse. And so you have these different pacemaker cells and pacemaker or yeah, pacemaker cells that make a, a node. The main one is up here, and then we got a second one here. And they got cells that discharge um, ions and they fire rhythmically and they sh you know, shoot an electrical impulse through the whole myocardium about 70 times a minute, more or less. Uh, 60, 70 impulses come then from here. So the first impulse comes from the atrium and then it spreads over the atrium and then it has a second place that's called the atrioventricular node. That's more theoretical thinking right now. And oh, before we finish the class, make sure you remind me of the review. I want to talk to you about the review. Uh, but from there, that signal that comes from the top of the atrium gets amplified and spreads through the whole ventricular walls and stimulates and irritates the muscle at once and the heart muscle then contract all together at once time. The atria a little bit ahead and the ventricles then strongly right after. So when we look at all these names, you have a few different names. Uh, so we did that the SA node is the one on top, they call it the sinoatrial node, that's the main pacemaker. The AV node are the amplifiers, that's the atrioventricular node. And then from there, um, we have a main bundle that comes down, a main nerve type thing, that's called the bundle of his. Don't ask me why his or not hers, but it is his. And there it splits and we have a bundle branch on the right side and a bundle branch on the left side. Um, and as it reaches around the apex, they call them Purkinje fibers. So this is just so you get confused, okay? But again, what's the point? We need to know those names to some level, and I don't think I'm gonna make you study those names. We'll talk about that. But we need to understand the concept most importantly. Yeah, it's not on this thing. And the concept here was most important is that the heart has its own conduction system that makes it contract independently. You take a heart out, as long as it has oxygen, it contracts. It's on, it does itself. And it has such a cool system that it spreads that impulse through all the heart muscles because you've got a lot of different cells here. They're all different cells and they all contract at the same time. How the heck are you gonna do that? The answer is gap junctions. Remember gap junctions from the uh, uh, um, epithelial tissues? The junctions that hold the cells together? The desmosomes, yeah. the tight junctions, and the gap junctions. And the gap junctions are, are little channels between the cells, and they let, they let the ions, the nerve impulse is ion stuff, it's electricity, let it go through all the cells. And that way, that's how we can contract all the cells together at once. And the other cool thing you remember is that atria go a little ahead of the ventricle, and we'll get that in a minute. Oh look, here is a slide with the gap junctions. <laughs> right there. So the gap junctions, these are heart muscles, and these are, somewhere there is junctions. Somewhere there was junctions, yeah, these discs. Um, but the important part there is the heart muscle contracts as one unit. And the technical term, since we need technical terms, is called the functional syncytium. Woo! In sync. And then I forgot the songs. We are in sync. And ultimately, you've probably noticed you go running and the heart pumps faster. It, hopefully. <laughs> and, and that's when there's multiple factors. Some of them are also right in the heart itself. But the heart can be influenced by the autonomic nervous system. And when we say autonomic nervous system, we mean automatic. So all the stuff in the body that you don't have to think about is autonomic stuff for the most part. That's for us, right? So one of the things is, how deep do you breathe? When you stop breathing, how fast your heart goes, all that stuff is in the autonomic nervous system. And most of the autonomic nervous system stuff happens in that lower part of the brain, our salamander brain. 
And that's where we can influence frequency and force of a contraction of a heart in addition to what the heart does on its own. So I think that's pretty neat. It's pretty neat. And you've all seen that, right? You've all seen that, right? Otherwise, we've got a story about it. Have you ever asked what it is? Yeah. It's the electricity measured that goes across the heart. And so it measures this electricity impulse. Every impulse is measured. And when you do a nerve impulse, oh, we haven't talked about nerve impulse yet. That's not yet. When you do a nerve impulse, I just worked on those chapter slides. I hope they're actually okay. <coughs> um, a nerve impulse is a contraction time. I mean, the nerve, the nerve needs to irritate the, the system, the cell. And then it needs to reestablish all the chemical stuff it made to do that situation, to give you that shock. Think of a shock that goes through the system. So when we shock, we call that a depolarization. Depolarization is, 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 a, is, a, is sort of a nerve impulse. You think of a nerve impulse when you think of a depolarization. It has to do with ions being positive and negative and moving across the cell membrane and polarizing and depolarizing. So we'll get to that in that chapter. But right now you're just thinking nerve impulse. So when we look at an electrocardiogram, we got a, 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 a first wave. And then we got a long, big wave thing. And then we got a last little dip there. We call that PQRST. Don't ask me why they started at P, but that's what they call it. So the P is a wave, and the P wave measures the nerve impulse going over the atrium. And then that's where you see the difference in, in timing. And then the QRS complex, because it's, it's bigger and has more data points to it, is known when the Nerve impulse goes over the ventricle. So it spreads over the ventricle and then it contracts. And then the T wave is known as ventricular repolarization, which is when a chemical gets scrambled back so all the ions are in the right place so we can have a next nerve impulse. But that also shows up as a bump. And so there you have it. So for the most part, what we need to know here is the atrial contract, the ventricles contract, or the atrial send a nerve impulse to then contract, nerve impulse to contract on atrial, nerve impulse to contract to ventricle, and reorganizing the chemicals. And we'll get to what that means. That's that repolarization. It's just you can't send a nerve impulse right after the other. You have to wait for a whole second just briefly to reorganize it all. So in a heart, when, we, when then the muscle of the whole heart muscle contracts, ha, I made a mistake. Sorry about that. Uh-oh. I did those, I read through those about three or four times. I didn't catch that. So systole is when a muscle contracts. Thank God you didn't study for the test yet, huh? Diastole is when a muscle relax. So you have these two things, contract, relax, contract, relax. So every contraction uses moves a little bit of blood, small volumes of blood, synchronously into the pulmonary trunk and the aorta. And that creates then a biphasic cycle because the, the no, well, hold on, the biphasic is not there. The systole is the contraction, and then the diastole is when we don't contract, and that's the re relaxation at the end. So the nerve fires and the nerve don't fire, that's on the nerve side. Whenever a nerve fires, we get a systole. 
And that cycle, because we've got these two things, is known as a biphasic cycle. Bi means two, phasic means phases. Yeah, but I read it all these slides because I think this is a better picture. Uh, I don't know. Well, it's bound to happen. Just switch it. So the other thing here is on that slide is is the is is again the fact that the valves the valves guard from backflow. The valves make sure they prevent that blood ever flows back. Because the next thing we need to talk about is when the heart we hear heart sounds. Look the look the look the look the look the and we hear these heart sounds when the valves close. So we hear two sounds, we hear one sound, but it's from two valves, love, when the AV valves close. And then we hear the second sound, dub, when the semilunar valves close. Love them, love them, love them. And we can listen to those things. We can auscultate. Auscultate means listen. It's a very important for the exam. So we listen at multiple places to those valves. The projection of the sound waves goes to the chest wall, in, not right over the valve. So that's why I put that picture. If you ever do lab stuff, you see where to put the stethoscope on to listen to those valves. And here they are. This is. Here they are on the skeleton, so you can measure ribs where it is. Um, then, and this is also kind of cool because we'll get to that in the next slide. But when a heart valve doesn't close properly or doesn't open properly, we get a heart murmur. So that's pathologically distorted. And so when it's not opening, we call it stenosis. Shh, that's the shh. When you listen to it, it goes loved up, shh. Or when it's insufficient. No, I think when it's stenosed, it goes shh, love. Because it's, it's uh, not letting the block go in properly, through it properly. And so this turbulent, the turbulent sound is before the heart sound valve closes. And when it's insufficient, then you hear a, a, sh a shushing sound after the sound. Because the block goes a little bit back. So you hear a love, shh, dub, shh, that kind of stuff. But it's those two things. It's either the valve's too narrow or it doesn't close enough. What are the complications of that? Well, it's hard on the heart muscle. It takes more force to pump the whole thing around. So depending on what's going on, you can just wear out the heart faster. See, that's where it all come together. That's a lot of stuff on this slide. That's why I made a big page out of that. Because I really like, this is from the Marriott books, really cool. Up here, you see the electrocardiogram. P wave, QRS complex, T wave. So you see the electricity, electricity, electro. Then down here, you see the heart sounds. You see when it closes. It closes after the QRS complex and after the T wave. And then down here we have pressure values. How much pressure is when in this situation, when this whole thing goes as a cycle, where, in the, which, uh, where do you have how much pressure? So what's in the left atrium? What's in the left ventricle? You see like right here, after the QRS goes, which is the ventricular contraction, the value of the ventricular pressure goes way up. And as soon as the volume completely drops, the pressure will drop. So this is a really cool graph. This is way more than we need to know. But you can trace it down, what we understood now, and you actually can make sense of it. The data on here is not excessive, it's just really a lot of data on one thing. So we have a pressure, a volume, and then the valves. Are they open or closed? AV valves, pulmonary and aortic valves. And then down here, we have visuals of what happens during which phase of the cardiac cycle. And so let me go through that because when we look at the cardiac cycle, we have a first phase that's called the ventricular filling. That's when the blood comes in from the atria and fills up the ventricle passively. It flows passively through there. 
And then we have, at the end of this diastole, the atria contract a little bit. That's the first part, that P wave. And when that contracts, it fills the ventricle more completely. So it adds up to 20% of filling, that's a lot. So it pushes it in, it's like the, you know, the Tokyo subway pushers. It pushes the blood in as much as you can into the ventricle. That's known as an, the atrial contraction or the atrial kick. And then from there, we get this isovolumetric ventricular contraction. Great. Iso means same. Volume means the same volume. So that's a period when the inside of the ventricle contracts and gets more and more pressure on the inside and the AV valve is already closed, so the blood doesn't go back to the atrium, but the semilunar valve of the pulmonary, the semilunar valves, pulmonary aortic, are not yet open. And so the volume gets pushed further and further, and as soon as the, they open, the semilunar valves open, we have ventricular ejection, and the blood gets forced out. So see here, all the valves are closed. And then here, the blood gets forced into the aorta of the pulmonary trunk. That's why I like this picture. They are really that detailed. Um, and then from there, we have an isovolumetric relaxation, which is just the same as the force builds up. The force comes, comes back down, or gets bigger. For a brief moment, the semilunars are closed, and the AV, the atrioventricular valves are also closed. So that's what that part is. And from there, we go, bless you, we go back to ventricular filling. We do the whole cycle again. So that's known as the cardiac cycle. Ooh. You got that? So, um, the ventricular ejection yep. is when you have a stroke? No, that's, no, this happens every time it heart pumps. This is not pathology, this is regular working. So the ventricular injection means when the blood gets pumped out of the ventricles. Oh. That's actually the kahuna. That's what we want. As a result, we want to pump that blood through the system. So yeah, that's the pumping the blood. That's the that's this one. The blood goes out, right here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Well, that's cool. I appreciate that. And then and then now we you know we have the heart contract and pump blood and every. Time it pumps blood, it pumps a little bit of blood, and that little bit of blood is known as the stroke volume. Every time it strikes, it pumps a little bit of blood. How much is that little bit of blood? Mostly at rest, it's about 70 milliliters. That's, you know, <laughs> that's 100, that thing down here. So 70 is by, you know, by the plastic thing, about. So that's about. 70, I know, it's metric stuff. But when the heart wants to forcefully contract really heavily, it go up to 140. So it can double the volume. So actually, when it can stretch more and then push more. That happens. And then the other t thing we have, we have stroke volume, and then we have heart rate. How many times does the heart pump? That depends how much blood goes to the system. Now what we do is we measure that per minute. So we measure that in one minute, and we call that cardiac output, and we say heart rate, where is it? Heart rate, how many times we pump, plus that stroke volume, here, stroke volume, each time it pumps, gives us the cardiac output, which is how much blood gets pumped in one minute. So we can have the volume be from 70 to about 140, the rate, at rest about 70, can go up to 180. So you can pump, if you do 70 beats, 70 milliliters, so about five liters a minute. What's that, gallon, two, two gallons more or less? Um, we can go up to 25 liters a minute. We can five times that blood frush and go through the system. So that's pretty cool. I know. Well, I mean, we might not want to always push it, but we could. If there's a line in the corner, you always think of this. If there's a line in the corner, what are you going to do? And you know the flight or flight system has a lot to do with how much oxygen gets to the tissues. All right. Well, with that, is there any questions?
No, I'm sure there's lots of questions, but we'll do those on Wednesday.